Hello and good evening to you. Welcome to News 360's live on news up here at Adesawa in Kanda. My name is Alfred Akansi. And I'm Natalie Fort. Let's get into the headlines for this evening. The headlines is brought to you by... Members of invisible forces in Tema threaten to visit mayhem on government officials over failure to provide them jobs. Also, a minority NDC walks out of Parliament over what they describe as disrespect by the Speaker. And green light for broken down vehicles to be towed off roads from September 1. And Parliament approves stay of two former Guantanamo Bay detainees. Coming up on the international front this evening, we'll be taking you to Pakistan as the Prime Minister of Pakistan has been today. We've got the details of these stories for you, plus the very latest from the world of sports and entertainment here on News 36. Remember, we're streaming live on 3news.com as well as TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Let's start off with our very first story this evening evening. Members of the invisible forces in Tema have threatened to visit mayhem on government officials over their failure to provide them jobs. Angry, heavy, heavily built men who stormed a town hall meeting organized by the information ministry in Tema say they have run out of patience on the failed promises of government. It was a maiden edition of the town hall meeting organized by the information ministry. Angry and outraged members of the new patriotic party's vigilante group and visible forces were clear in their message. We want to tell our people, if they will not give us work to do, what's happening at Kumase, the same thing will happen to you. Venting their anger, the disgruntled group called the bluff of some senior members of the party who they claim have deserted them despite their sacrifices for the party. We, we are even ashamed. Some of us, we are, are working in the side and we are laughing at us. Is that how the party is supposed to treat us? Impossible! Impossible! Early on this year, members of the Delta Force, a pro MPP vigilante group, stormed the offices of the Ashanti Regional Coordinating Council and removed the President's security coordinator appointee who they claim they do not know. The President later directed the Inspector General of Police to deal ruthlessly with any group which flouts the laws of Ghana by visiting mayhem on innocent individuals. These current threats by these individuals is yet to be given a direct response from government despite the presence of the Minister of Information at a town hall meeting. Kamala Klusha, MG News, Accra. Well, the minority in parliament walked out of the chamber in protest over the conduct of the Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay. This was after the Speaker had ignored views from the minority leader, Harun Idriso, when a motion on rescission of the, the Ameri deal was moved in the House by the Member of Parliament for Adansia Sokwa, Kwabana Tahir Hammond. The minority accused the Speaker of endangering parliamentary democracy in the country. The MP for Adansia Sokwa, Katie Hammond, had filed a motion asking for the rescission of the Ameri deal, which was approved by the last parliament. The minority had also raised issues asking for official government's position on it. On Tuesday, Katie Hammond moved the motion and was seconded to by the deputy majority leader. The speaker then referred the matter to the Mines and Energy Committee, but the minority raised objections, arguing the standing orders were not being followed. While the minority leader was on his feet, Katie Hammond rose for a point of order. He said since he had not made known the information he had, the minority leader who was referring to a Supreme Court ruling should be ruled out of order to which the speaker did. The minority leader was not given the opportunity to continue with his statement, and the speaker gave his ruling. The minority said the speaker was again showing disrespect to them. The matter the civil parliament considered was referred to it by the executive. We have since not had answers to it. 
The Speaker was not prepared to interpret the standing orders even though he is vested with authority to do so. More importantly, even as I was on my feet and I referred to the Ndabugri versus the Attorney General and two others, he did not allow me to refer to the particular quote. He only responded to a point of order by the Honorable KT Hamon and again went into his bizarre conclusion on the matter. Under the circumstance, we have no option than to protest the manner in which he is endangering parliamentary democracy and his practice. Minority Chief Webb indicated if the Speaker continues on such a path, they may be compelled to start an impeachment process against him. For the first time, just go and check on the 53. It is the majority leader who gets up with the indulgence of the Mr. Speaker and the House to vary the business of the day. You don't have the Speaker himself running the House as if it's a small church or his small home where he decides which business he calls. It's not done that way. You were there when we were debating the uh, 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 Get More 2. Members get up. You participate in the debate. Speaker does not participate in the debate. He was participating in the debate. Such an important thing. He said he was going to allow only two people to speak. We decided that fine. We want two people to speak, let them have the space. Even when a member, Honorable Mama Yaga, was reminding him that this is the only platform that ordinary citizens of this country can express themselves without being held, he will not buy. Meanwhile, the majority leader said the minority is not subjecting themselves to the rules of the House. They want to be granted exemption of the rules. That certainly cannot be accommodated. That cannot be accommodated. So we are talking about the rules of procedure. Parliament is a house that makes laws, and we ourselves are governed by laws. And still in Parliament, the Committee on Roads and Transport has given the green light for the road towing project to be implemented on the 1st of September this year. Committee Chairman Samuel Ayepe says the committee has looked at the details of the contract and finds no problem with it. Road accidents had taken a great toll on government coffers. Millions of cities have been lost to road traffic accidents. The National Road Safety Commission says over 20% of road accidents were due to broken down vehicles. The commission says these vehicles are left on the roads, endangering lives. Implementation of the road towing project was halted after a public outcry over the levy project. The Committee on Roads and Transport, which held a series of meetings with stakeholders, said it was satisfied with the contract details. We set up an outdoor committee within the committee to study the, 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 the contract and other documents that we've received from uh, the private operator, service providers and other petitioners. And uh, they came back to us, we sat as a committee and we've come up with the report. The bottom line of it is that the project is a good report, project, yes, except that a proper education was not done. The chairman of the committee added the 20-year contract, which was signed in 2016, is subject to review after every five years. The date that these are fees and charges were approved by parliament, somewhere and to, the proposals were made in 2004. So if a, a fee had been set up in 2004, looking at inflation and what has happened in the economy from 2004 to date, you can't just go and say reverse it, reduce it. So what we have done is that uh, we make a system for other organizations and individuals to benefit. So we've taken 2.5 of the 85% that the airline says is good to the, private, uh, the, the, the service provider to national ambulance service. So we've also taken 2.5 of the proceeds to health insurance. So they'll use as a premium. He said the project had lots of lofty ideas, but was not well explained to the public. All right, so uh, this particular story still rages on, reason being that it generated a lot of controversy uh, before the July 1 date when it was supposed to take effect. The Honorable uh, Samo Ayepe is uh, with us in studio. He is the chairman of this particular committee that approved this fees earlier today. He's a member of parliament for the Ayenso and constituencies. It's good to have you. Good evening, Chair. Uh, good evening. And how are you? I'm doing well. well. Um, I'm hoping to get better after better and better particulars for you. <laughs> on this issue. Uh, absolutely. Right. Clearly. Right. Because yeah. earlier on, one of the concerns that was raised was that 
you are putting all of us into more like a pool so that if, even if your car gets broken yeah. down or not, so long as you're going to pay f for uh, renew no, renewal of, mm -hmm. of your roadworthy, you're paying for this service, exactly. even if your car doesn't get broken. In your deliberations, did you change anything in uh, this respect? Actually, not uh, really. We uh, did not change anything, but rather we've made proposals to Which is? the uh, minister. We know this uh, LI was passed by parliament far back in 2012. Mm -hmm. That's uh, LI uh, 2012. LI 21, uh, Revolution 2012, LI 2180 was passed by Parliament. And uh, the a contract between the private operator and the government of Ghana was signed in 2016. So uh, when they made an attempt to implement this uh, a contract, uh, then they, there was this reaction uh, from the public and then the, uh, the root uh, industry. Uh, uh, raising issues that they are not aware, they don't understand the project, and in practice, uh, or a convention in parliament, uh, when parliament pass a bill into an act or an ally, and issues like this uh, comes up, it's important the committee steps in and uh, help the ministry to have the issues resolved. So mm -hmm. quickly, the Rules and uh, Transport Committee uh, invited the minister and the agency, in this case, uh, National Road Safety Commission, right. and then the, the service provider in a meeting. And then the, uh, we, after meeting them, we decided that we, the minister should quickly go and extend the commencement date, whilst uh, the committee do a lot of consultation in the uh, stakeholders of the industry. So okay. indeed, we met a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, then in the GPL, the Ghana Traffic with Transport Union, we met the Ghana uh, Transport Coordinating Council, right. we met other road advocates. And, and, and what exactly result, were their recommendations? A, the the meeting all these the stakeholders show clearly that yes, uh, they welcome the project. It's a good project, it should come. They were having some uh, issues with the, with the project. Those issues, we listened to them and uh, we uh, addressed some of them. Some of the issues uh, will be difficult for the committee to address. For instance, the committee, we don't have the power, the capacity to abrogate contract. That mm -hmm. is left to the, to the executives, that is the, the minister. So those that we have control, we have made proposal to the minister to take Because I recall one of the questions that was raised was about the procedure for awarding the contract to one company to have about 85% of proceeds. It, it, it is not the, the procedure per se, but it is the fact that... Uh, it's, it's about monopoly, where one... Absolutely, yeah, you're giving it to uh, just one company. Yeah, one company. Did and you address we, we that? Are, we, 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 we went into that. We, we actually find out what happened. As a matter of fact, looking at what we want to do, or the ministry want to do, clearly, we, it's issue about capacity. As we speak, uh, the only uh, company that has shown capacity to handle this project is the company that has been uh, given this contract. So as we speak, did, did they tell us whether there was competitive bidding in the process? That is, that, is why when, that is why when you mentioned the process, I said it is not the process, but the fact that one company had been given the contract. That is different from the process of awarding the contract. If, if the bid was not open and it was restricted to only one then company, there of course, then we're about talking that. about the process. But that is not what happened. But, but the, the fact is that, it. yes, one, one company actually got mm -hmm. it uh, across the board. The Russian track, for instance, mm -hmm. was looking at zoning the countries into uh, other individual organizations uh, who, and organizations who are prepared to, to do that. The fact remains that uh, we are talking about attributed tracks that need to be taken off the road. Mm -hmm. We need heavy duty towing tracks that will be able to do that. We are not talking about towing the vehicle from the road. We are talking about res vehicle reception centers okay. where the private operator ought to get a reception center across the country. You pick the truck, you can't go just and dump it on another route. Then mm -hmm. you haven't done anything. So when the vehicles are towed, they are sent to vehicle reception center. The reception center should be a fenced area, yard, with a security and even mechanics. Because okay. if the vehicle is sent to the reception center and the fort is not all that uh, big, uh, huge, the, the mechanics there can repair your vehicle and take it away, or right. you take it to your mechanics. So it involves more than just doing. Honorable, I'm going to come to you again uh, to find out about how you address the issue of cost, because 
the public was concerned that, I mean, the GPRTO did indicate that they were going to pass on the cost to us, those who, you know, patronize these trotters and taxis, majority of Ghanaians indeed. I've been joined on the telephone by Deputy Minister for Transport, the Honorable Titus Glover. Honorable, good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, the Committee of Transport in Parliament, indeed the chairman is here saying they've made recommendations to your ministry about this particular uh, towing levy to the extent that they want the National Health Insurance Authority, the ambulance service, and also the National Road Safety and others to benefit from all of this. Is this something you're going to work with? Sorry, we seem to have lost him on the telephone. Try to raise him back again and, and get it from him. That's the Honorable Titles Glover. We'll get him back on the telephone. But one of the qu questions that was raised was about the cost. I mean, you have, depending on, on the tonnage, commercial and non-commercial paying between 20 cities and 200 Ghana cities. Mm. And yes. the GPRTU indicated that they were going to pass on the cost uh, to commuters. Yeah, very Ghanaians. good. Very well. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, when we met the GPRTU, they brought this issue up. And uh, when we look at the contract and the fees and the, uh, the capacity of vehicle that are supposed to pay it according to, uh, the payment is according to the capacity of the, the cubic capacity of every vehicle. Cap vehicles up to 2.0 cc uh, to pay 20 cities. And the question is this, uh, 20 cities per whole year, mm -hmm. unless it's a commercial vehicle who will pay, because they renew their roadworthiness certificate twice in a year. So every six months you pay 20 Ghana cities. And if you are to pass 20 Ghana cities to a number of customers you will serve uh, within six months, I don't think uh, the GPR to. In fact, when we met them, after explaining to them, they got to know that, oh, yes, uh, they don't see how they are going to spread 20 cities. Over at the end of the year, so it'll be 40 cities. Are you saying for a whole a, 12 by assurance to the viewers out there who it are watching is not, us this it evening? It is not going I, I to increase the, 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 the transport fares. What we, we saw that vehicles that are supposed to be the 20 Ghana. 200 Ghana cities are talking about, they do got less than 5% of the, the, the vehicles that are going to pay the fees. So these are heavy accredited trucks that uh, take goods or cut goods from uh, Tema and other uh, jurisdictions. So uh, we look at all this and we find out that uh, the chunk of vehicles that are going to be will range from 20 Ghana cities to 40 Ghana cities per year, of which we don't think uh, is going to affect. And also, there's this mm -hmm. point that we need to clear. You okay. see, uh, uh, it's just like an insurance. Uh, somebody may pay the national health insurance, but maybe where he attends or the doctor that he prefer to take all of him we may not even take health insurance. Yet every year, the person we will go ahead and renew Absolutely. your insurance. Well, so, also, so also we are helping. Why should we be paying for the irresponsibility and the discipline uh, uh, on the part uh, of uh, people uh, uh, whose uh, cars uh, get broken uh, on uh, the roads? Exactly. So and, what, and, what and we are there. saying is that what we are saying is that you, you are helping yourself by getting these vehicles off the road. Let me give you a very typical example. Uh, the Kotoko players who got themselves involved in this accident, how many of them could it have any pay to get their broken down vehicles off the road? No, but, yet, but, but, but do, yet do you know because somebody left his vehicle on the road, the, the their road. vehicle runs into it. We right, have right, uh, right, Dr. Kufia a former MP for Akwetia okay. and a lecturer, a medical school lecturer, who wow. will, will be able to pay. Yet, okay. somebody left but, his but, car but, and his truck. But, but we, we also have information. You know, some insurance companies, before they decide on their premium, mm. also takes into consideration some of these costs, yeah, yeah, cost of towing. So are we not charging double cost it, it, from it, the American? The because fact is if I, am, I have insurance, mm. honorable, I have, I have insurance on mm. my car. And if I'm going to renew my, div, my mm. roadworthy, mm. I'm supposed to also pay something else for towing mm. when my insurance company is charging uh, me no, for towing? No, the, the insurance is an additional cost. The premium you pay. There are stages in the in the premium. So the a premium where you pay the towing will not be part of it. There's another stage of a premium you pay that includes the towing. So if these projects come to stay and work effectively, there's no need for you. So to go meaning and that the insurance the companies are going to deduct. No, they are not going to deduct. The, the options are there. So that's you, my you, point. It no, means that what I'm saying if I get to the premium where I'm will you, paying, will you allow me to make a towing. point? My point is this: when you are going to pay your insurance premium, mm -hmm. we have options. Okay. So if this project come to work and work effectively, there's no way f the need for you to go for an option where the okay. doing is part uh, let of it. Let me go on to the telephone. Uh, the Honorable Titus Glover is joining me back on the telephone. Honorable, thank you very yeah. much for joining us. Now, the Committee of Transport and Parliament has made recommendations to your ministry about this levy. Are you going to work with them as, as recommended? Uh, thank you very much. Yesterday they met us. 
myself and my minister, and they give us their reports. And they give us their reports. What my minister told them is that he's going to sit with his technical people at the ministry, have a look at it. Then you have to forward it to the president to have a look at it. So I must admit that this is a very fantastic report that the, 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 the Roads and Transport Committee of Parliament have done. Very fantastic work. When you look at the detail, financially, when you talk about the 85% that is going to the service provider, they have made some proposal that 10% should be taken from that 85% and divided it to two. You give the first 5% to support national health insurance, the second 5% to support national ambulance service. They also indicate or propose that in the next five years, should this program take off, in the next five years, there should never be any increment in the, the increase of the fees that, that they are going to charge and all that. So right. they also encourage us to continue to engage the stakeholders in the dialogue process and all that. So it's a very wonderful, wonderful report that they have done to us. So okay. I think that we have taken it in good faith and we'll take it to the ministry. We have a, a team together with the minister and myself will look at it either. A two-page report is nothing that is uh, difficult to, to consume. You know right. what I mean. Therefore, when immediately finish, they need to confirm with the president that we will look at. Honorable, one of the concerns that was raised earlier on was about the lack of sensitization for the public to get to know all of this. That's why it was even suspended. Uh, what's the plan to sensitize the general public about this before the implementation date again? Yes, it is true. That was the more reason why the minister calls for his suspension. And they've also indicated that we should continue to engage the stakeholders in all that. Our major, our uh, uh, agency, that is the National Road Safety Commission, have to come out with a roadmap in terms of the sensitization. Then the ministry will give our full backing and support to it to make it pressure. So we've engaged them. We've asked them to do, we've asked them to draw a program for us, for us to have a look at it, right. and uh, we'll be able to 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 roll it out. God willing. I'm grateful. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good, good evening. Welcome. That's your noble uh, deputy uh, minister for transport, Nit. Uh, Kwate Titus Glover is a member of parliament as well. Um, Natalie is here to just run us through the, the statistics of how really uh, this levy looks like. Natalie. That a whole 80, we should say not 85 percent in this context, but 80 percent going to the service provider. But here's a breakdown of the revenue sharing structure between all the stakeholders. The Ghana Police Service receives five percent, while the National Road Safety Commission receives five, five percent as well. The Ministry of Finance gets a five percent share on the amount as well. Road Safety Management Company Limited, which is the service provider, receives. 80%, that's a pretty big number as compared to the rest. But it's been broken down. The National Health Insurance Agency receives 2.5%, while the Ambulance Service receives 2.5%. So that's, that's how everything is going to be broken down. The Health Insurance Authority is going to be used for treatment of accident victims. So that's to compensate them. So, uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's one a split there. I don't know. I don't have the facts yet. Okay. But I think there's other police service or the Minister of Finance is sharing with DVL. Yes. 2.5 to percent. 2.5. So it means that there's a reduction yeah. for the road safety management companies because earlier on they were supposed to be given 85%. 85%. So yeah. you raised some we, agreement we, 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 Yeah, this is a proposal we've made to the Minister that they should we consider that. Uh, we are we propose this because of the the uh, the rule right. of the uh, uh, National Health Insurance sure, Authority. Sure. Yes. When vehicles involve in accident and then the injured sent to hospital, uh, tap the family members or your health insurance card may not be readily available for you to receive services. So what we are suggesting is that uh, right. you 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 get a service and then the the road safety fee paid for it. Oh, well, th <laughs> thank you. And, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully yeah. we get a lot more uh, sensitization on this before you. implementation. But I'm grateful. If you look at bullet point six, yeah. we've asked the. Uh, the, the National Road Safety Commission and its agencies to intensify their campaign to make sure they report back to the committee before the project is I'm grateful started. for your time. Thank you. He's the chairman of the Roads and Transport Committee, Samo Ayapai. Uh, there. Away from that, the Ghana Climate Innovation Center has embarked on a regional sensitization fora dubbed the Green Business Roadshow. The fora will provide a platform for the center to engage with stakeholders who are into climate innovation business commonly called Ghana's Green Economy. 
The first of the regional fora took place in Sunyani where Baden entrepreneurs involved in climate innovation ventures attended. The Ghana Climate Innovation Center intends to support local entrepreneurs to develop appropriate business solutions in mitigating climate change in Ghana. Gloria Saredu, who made use of the Ghana Climate Innovative Center ideas years ago, is now the proprietor of Global Bamboo Company, engaged in the use of bamboo which is climate friendly. I have some outgrowers who are working with us. What they do is that they intercrop crops with the bamboo. So they plant the bamboo and then they also intercrop with their maize, with their cassava and other things. And where we cultivate the bamboo, it gives them a higher yield. The Deputy Bonahafu Regional Minister, Evans Opoku Bobie, commended the organizers for instituting the program to promote climate-friendly business ventures. The Executive Director of the Ghana Climate Innovative Center, Ruka Sanusi, explained how one could access support from the center. Our responsibility as part of a particular program um, at the World Bank is to ensure that climate change um, is at the forefront of our mind and to support businesses um, who also have climate change at the forefront of their mind to ensure that this wonderful, amazing world that we live in will exist for generations to come to enjoy it. Still to come tonight. Parliament approves a stay of two former Guantanamo Bay detainees. Also, also coming up in business this evening, some financial analysts doubt government ability to achieve overall GDP growth rate target for 2017. And on the international front, Pakistani lawmakers elect Shahid Kakan Abbasi as Prime Minister, replacing Nawaz Sharif. Welcome back to News 360. Time now for some business news. Top on the news this evening from the world of business, some financial analysts say government's overall GDP growth rate target for 2017 might not be achieved, despite commending government for stabilizing the economy and re-establishing the principles of good economic governance. They say the cuts in revenue and expenditure do not support a 6.3% growth target. Real GDP growth for 2016 was 3.5% against the provisional estimate of 3.6%. Fiscal deficit for 2016 was 9.3% of GDP compared to the provisional figure of 8.7% of GDP on cash basis. As the review of the 2017 budget, government maintained the overall GDP growth rate for 2017 at 6.3%, while end-of-year inflation rate was also maintained at 11.2%. Government's overall fiscal deficit target for 2017 was revised downwards from 6.5% of GDP to 6.3% of GDP. A senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Lord Mensah, however, says the growth targets are overly ambitious. Government spending is part of, you know, the, the indicators to, to compute your GDP. So for the growth, I don't think the 6.3 can be achieved. He commended governments for striving to ensure the country lives within its means, which is a sign of prudent economic management. So for me, it's, it's a platform that will lay the foundation for all their policies that they want to roll out at the, what, at the citizenry level to, to, to take its shape. The general manager of GN Research, Samuel Ampa, also conceded the growth and deficit targets are challenged, considering the cuts in revenue and expenditure targets. The GDP projections for 2017 is quite over ambitious. Government needed to take a, a, you know, a step by reducing its projections. He praised government for efforts to lay the foundation for a successful implementation of its flagship programs in the second half of 2017. They have been able to bring the economy on track. Inflation has slowed down. Monetary policy rate has been reduced. Um, interest rates um, on the 91-day bill has gone down. Really, there's been some macro economic stability. If it comes to the fiscal...
On to other stories now. Barclays Bank Ghana has relaunched its business club. The club is intended to reaffirm continuous support to the growth and development of businesses in the country. For 11 years, Barclays Business Club has played a major role in adding value to businesses. The dependable preferred financial partner has been investing and involving with different innovations. The relaunch will add on new products to benefit prospective and existing clients. What we've done over the years in Business Club is help our customers achieve their ambitions the right way. And as we evolve, we are looking at how do we bring more value to this. So we want to make sure that the business lives are actually transformed. Country lead, retail and business banking at Barclays Bank Ghana, Nia Mankra explained the club's intention is deeply rooted in its shared growth agenda through which assets and resources can help create value for businesses and communities. It provides actual training, training that is relevant to what they do every day and allows their businesses to grow. The Minister for Business Development, Ibrahim Mohamed Awal, encouraged the bank to be more innovative in providing service to clients. He advised banks to introduce services that will satisfy the needs of clients. Today, financial acquisition is not the best. How can you create a prosperous economy if 60% of people do not have bank accounts? How can you create a prosperous economy if many of the people do not trust the banking environment? Back in this bank and the bank, you have a big role to play. You need to come out with policies, with products and services that will not only convince Ghanaians to open bank accounts, but that will make them trust the banking system. The club, which started in 2006, embarks on business seminars, networking conferences, ICT training. and UMB Capital have launched the UMB Foundation in Accra. The foundation aims to support initiatives in education, health and projects that celebrate and promote Ghanaian heritage and culture. The Universal Merchant Bank, a full-service financial institution which specializes in customized banking products and services, and its sister company, UMB Capital, a management investment and consultancy services company, have offered distinctive services to Ghanaians since 1972. The companies are recognized for their entrepreneurial approach and innovative use of technology. To give back to society and the environment from which they operate, the companies have launched the UMB Foundation to execute its corporate social responsibility initiatives. The UMB Foundation will support initiatives in education, health and projects that celebrate and promote Ghanaian heritage and culture. Launching the foundation in Accra, the board chair of UMB Foundation, Grace Ami Obey, said UMB Bank and UMB Capital Success can be attributed to the beautiful people of Ghana. Everybody has to give back to society. We do that even in our homes in several ways, fostering relatives here and there. But this is a, a focused uh, uh, strategy to have impactful and sustainable uh, uh, life so we are we are we are doing this uh, with the team that is committed and passionate about it the strategic focus of the foundation is improve access to education for economically disadvantaged children through scholarship assist in providing easy and quick access to quality health care especially for women and children and to support the restoration and maintenance of cultural sites, monuments, and buildings. Northern region, you know, we all know the health situation in the country, especially the situation connected with uh, mother and child delivery issues, child mortality. And so in our own small way, this is how we give back to society. The chief executive officer of UMB Foundation, Yvonne Botre, said the initial project in health will target northern and upper west regions while education will focus on the Volta region.
One of our guiding principles is to foster partnerships. We have some proposals that are in the pipeline that we'll be launching very soon, but it's also important for us to understand what other people are doing that, you know, good works that other people are doing in our key focus areas, and for us to evaluate whether we can also partner and participate in those initiatives as well. So it is important for us to receive proposals from outside organizations. The UMB Foundation is governed by an independent four-member board of directors supported by subcommittees taxed to improve activities in each key focus area. And that's it for the business news here on News 360 this evening. Remember, we have more business news on our website, freenews.com. We'll turn with more news shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back from that break uh, here on News 360. Let's go into Parliament now because Parliament has ratified the agreement between Ghana and the United States on the resettlement of two former Guantanamo Bay detainees. The Member of Parliament for North Tong Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, however, wanted clarity on what happens to the two after January 2018. The two Guantanamo Bay detainees were brought into Ghana last year and were given two years to stay. Their stay expires in January 2018. Government last week presented a paper in Parliament to ratify their stay in the country after a Supreme Court ruling last year. It was then referred to the Foreign Affairs Committee to be deliberated on and to submit a report. On Tuesday, the committee presented its report asking for the ratification on the resettlement of the two former Guantanamo Bay detainees. But ranking member of the committee, Samuel Okujetu Ablakwa, wanted government to come clear on the two stay after January 2018. Minister for Foreign Affairs, in her report to our committee, indicates that they are still in discussions with the United States authorities. So there is no clarity as to the future of, this, of these two persons, Mahmoud Omar Mohammed bin Atef and Khalid Mohammed Salih al -Dubi. I believe that clarity will be needed very quickly so that we will all know as a country, because it's a matter of public, immense public interest, we need to know what happens after January 2018. Are they going to leave the shores of Ghana? Would the United States government accept them? Or are they going to have full liberties to determine where they want to be? Would they want to continue to stay in Ghana? What will be the immigration modalities that will be followed and all of that? The majority leader agreed. Minority leader urged the House takes a cue from the Supreme Court ruling over the matter. Okay, so Thierry Yanni is here with all the news in the world of sports. Good yes. to have you, Thierry. <laughs> Good evening, Alfred and Natalie. Hi. Uh, well, let's get into the news then. Um, yeah, you know, let's get into the news. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he has something to say, but anyway, <laughs> let's get into the latest in the world of sports with me, Thierry Yan, right here on News 360. And we start off with Immanuel Ajman Bedou, the Ghanaian midfielder, has left the Italian Serie A side, Udinese, to join Turkish Tough Flight Club, Borussia Sport, on a bumper contract. The uh, midfielder will be playing in the Turkish Super League next season after agreeing to join Buzzaspor on loan for one season. The move ends Bedou's loyalty to the Udini based outfit Ma after uh, much talk in the Ghana um, you know, transfer market about his uh, unwillingness to leave the Italian Serie A side. Bedou has uh, 72 caps for Ghana with 11 goals to his name and was in the team that crashed out of the African Cup of Nations at the semi-final stage in Gabon. All right, now to some local news. And Kumasi Asante Kotoko are ready to play their first match after car accident a few weeks ago. Their comeback to the Ghana Premier League action is against Accra Hearts of Folk this Sunday. The Porcupine Warriors are not taking any chances in their game against their arch rivals. And Steve Pollack, their head coach, says there are no excuses not to perform in the remaining games this season. Our mind is looking forward um, to get the three points not only for the family of Kotoko, but also a good friend and a colleague, a working colleague. You know, we want to do that for him and for his family. And I think that's an incentive for not only the players, but also the supporters to get behind the team. 
Um, yes, they're always big games. Um, history tells you there's, there's not two, three, four, five goals in any games, uh, maybe once in a while. But I believe um, that we'll, we'll, we'll take the game on Sunday and get three points with everybody behind us. And, and like I said, the players are up for it. They're ready for it. And some of them wish it, the game was today, to be quite honest. So, um, no, we'll be ready for Sunday, that's for sure. Me personally and the team also, you know, we're just going to keep progressing. We'll take one game at a time. And by God's grace, and especially Sunday, we'll get the three points. And then we'll see at the season where we're at. I will not be making an excuse, the incident, if we get beat. So I don't just look at the game, I look at all the other aspect, then the game. And, you know, we will not use that as, a, as an excuse. I will, I will, I will find the reason why, we, if it didn't, doesn't go as we want it to be. But I believe and I have faith in my players, in myself, in my technical team. And the players also are positive, and that's how I want them to be, always thinking positive. And the positive thing is to be thinking about three points on Sunday. All right, now, so to the world of athletics, we return to football, but Team Ghana has landed in the United Kingdom ahead of the World Championships. The likes of Usain Bolt and Wade Van Nika, who shown in Brazil 2016 Olympics, will be present. Now, there are going to be a number of athletes who are also going to be competing for several, several, uh, you know, uh, medals in that particular one. Our own 400-meter sprinter, Emmanuel Dasso, spoke to us via Skype, insisting he will be ready but will take each event at a time. Going out there, we're going to run rounds. It's the heat, semifinals, and final. So when, when we're training or anything we are doing, we don't set up our mind specifically on just one thing. We, it's, it's, it's a broad thing. It's, it's a large thing. You can't just focus on one picture. It's, you have to focus on everything and every aspect that helps you to get there. A lot of the sports fraternities and sports disciplines here in this country um, usually have uh, very similar complaints and you, it usually runs along the line of finances. What exactly have been your challenges representing Ghana? Since day one, all sports in Ghana challenges are, are, are always being financed because sports is all about finance. If you don't have the finances, there's no way you could do a whole lot of things. But uh, uh, we at least we've set up our mindset from money. Was Money is the root of all evil. Once you put your mindset on money, 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 we need money, we need to do this, we need that. Yes, we do need it. So if the nation is not trying to help you or trying to support you, what do you have to do? Are you going to sit there and watch the nation, uh, uh, watch the nation do nothing or are you going to help yourself? At the end of the day, it's me. I am running. Even though I'm representing Ghana, any benefits that come, comes to me. So I have to invest in myself too. So I don't really focus on what is what uh, what I need from the nation or what the nation can do for me. All right, now, so I promised you we're going to return to football, and this is it. Daniel Ajay um, is one of the players I'm going to be talking about. South Africa looks like a safe haven for Ghanaian goalkeepers after the latest, uh, you know, to join the South African League was Razak Braima. But it is, uh, is it really, really safe, uh, you know, for these players who, uh, you know, match on to the South? Let's take a look at how they did from the experience of other Ghana goalkeepers who have traveled South. In 2013, um, and a 20 World Cup winner, Daniel LJ moved to join the Free State Stars where Zambian goalkeeper Kennedy Mwini had made a huge impact. Those big shoes he was unable to fill and certainly he was out of that particular. Well, after a full year, Daniel LJ managed only 17 appearances, five clean sheets and conceded 23 goals before he was deemed surplus to requirements by the club's hierarchy. The next man is Fatal Dauda. Um, he had a uh, successful African Cup of Nations campaign um, on a personal level in 2013. After a consistent run in the national colours, he joined Soweto Giants Orlando Pirates in the year 2014 and later Chipa United as well. He started in the 13th game 
of the season in a 1-0 loss to Sundowns. And that, you know, uh, clouded what exactly he experienced over there in that particular one. That exactly has been a trajectory for Ghanaians. Maybe Razak Bremer is going to be rewriting the script. Of course, we'll be bringing every subsequent development of that particular story right here on TV3. My name is Thierry Nyan. I'll catch you later. And in terms of the evening, it was a long and eventful day for the ladies of Ghana's Most Beautiful 2017. Their desire to know if they will make it to the reality complex will, however, be delayed for another 24 hours. This is because organizers say the decision has become necessary because contestants were neck to neck after today's encounter with the judges. Long-standing judge on the show, fashion designer Linda Apao, explained that the ladies would have to be taken through another stage of scrutiny. This, she explained, is as a result of ties between the representatives of the various regions. She stated further that in order to pick the best among the ladies, a lot more scrutiny would have to be done. Organizers explained also that in order to maintain the standard of a pageant which had been running for the past 10 years, educating the public on cultural heritage and its importance, it was the best decision. They said though all the ladies had exhibited competence and amazing intellectual performances, it is in the best interest of everyone. Some past queens of the pageant, including reigning queen Yaba, were there to observe and support the process. The season 11 certainly promises to be much more exciting Absolutely. than the previous. Absolutely. <laughs> Beauty with brains. I yes. mean, that's why they are neck to neck. And, certainly. Uh, certainly. Very intelligent and lovely ladies. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for staying with us here on News 360. My name is Alfred Akansi. And I'm Natalie Fort. We have more news on our website, 3news.com. News at 10 this evening. We'll also simulcast on 3FM 92.7. Next is Tashan. Have a wonderful evening.